and speak English. Doesn't speak English. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? A suspicious man. An innocent man. Parker violated Patel's civil rights. He was partially paralyzed. Criminal charges against Eric Parker were filed in state as well as federal court. Welcome back to the Lackluster Channel. In 2015, Suresh Pai Patel, an Indian national, traveled from his home in India to Madison, Alabama to visit his son. During his visit, he took a stroll in his son's neighborhood, during which a nearby resident called 911 to report a, quote, skinny black man wearing a tobacco. The man claimed on the call that Mr. Patel was suspicious looking and was peering into garages. Moments later, Mr. Patel was approached by two uniformed officers of the Madison Police Department. Officer Eric Parker demanded his identification, and though Mr. Patel speaks two languages, English was not one of them, and in the video, he can be heard telling the officers repeatedly that he did not know English and that he was from India. Hi, bud. I'll talk to you real quick. India? Your knee? You're doing what? Here, come here. Hang tight real quick. Where are you headed? Where? Going. I can't understand you, sir. Where's your address? Where do you live? Code one. Stop walking. Stop walking. Do you have any ID on you? No, no ID. What's your name? He's saying no English. He doesn't understand what he's saying. Okay. In less than a minute, the officers have determined that the man does not speak English, and when asked where he lived, Mr. Patel pointed in a general direction. One of the officers then asks for his ID. Section 15.5-30 of the Alabama Code makes it clear that the officers could demand of him his name, address, and an explanation of his actions, only if they reasonably suspect he is committing, has committed, or is about to commit a felony or other public offense. The standard of reasonable suspicion has been very clearly documented throughout the United States. It is the absolute lowest requirement that a law enforcement officer needs to demand identification, making reasonable, articulable suspicion the most basic legal standard that an officer should know. At this point, the only information the officers have is that an elderly man was walking, and another man on a phone call claimed he peered into a garage. And while some might find that behavior suspicious, others don't. Regardless, neither opinion of the man's suspiciousness supplies us with any objective reason to believe that a crime was afoot. While the officers always have the right to ask for an ID, at this point they have no authority to demand it. And even though Mr. Patel is not an American citizen, just about every constitutional protection besides voting still applies while he is in the United States. India. India. Do you live here? Do you live in this neighborhood? Where's your ad? Where are you going? Okay. Sir, sir, come here. We're trying to figure this out. Are you looking at houses and stuff? After asking Mr. Patel once more where he lives, he points in the direction of his son's home, says the address, and begins walking towards the house, motioning for the officers to follow. At this point, Officer Eric Parker grabs Mr. Patel and twists his arms behind his back. Mr. Patel appears motionless as Officer Parker tells him to relax. Do not jerk away from me again. If you do, I'm gonna put you on this ground. Do not jerk away from me one more time. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do not jerk away from me again. Wait a second. Sit tight. Relax. And just 90 seconds into the encounter, Officer Parker slams the 57-year-old, 115-pound Mr. Patel into the ground, head first with his hands held behind his back. The assault caused severe damage to Mr. Patel's vertebrae, causing his spinal cord to swell and leaving him permanently, partially paralyzed. Afterwards, the officers tried to get the paralyzed man to walk to their patrol car. You're all right. Put your legs on it. Stand up. Stand up. 
Mr. Patel was transported to a hospital where he would endure several surgeries and would slowly learn to walk again. Donors raised $209,000 for Mr. Patel from a GoFundMe fundraiser that helped pay for his medical bills. One week after the incident, Officer Parker was charged with third-degree assault. Soon after, he was indicted by a federal grand jury. Parker was then charged by the FBI with deprivation of rights under the color of law, a felony that carries a maximum of 10 years in prison. Prison. He pled not guilty, and the jury for his first trial failed to reach a verdict, and in January of 2016, an acquittal motion was granted, ending the federal criminal trial for Officer Parker permanently. The prosecution filed a counter motion, but the judge dismissed it, siding with the officer, claiming that Mr. Patel committed a misdemeanor by leaving the house without identification, which is absolutely ridiculous. But even if it were true, remember, Mr. Patel had no legal responsibility to prove he had one on his person. Shortly after the federal charges were dismissed, the state dropped Officer Parker's charges as well. Mr. Patel eventually filed a federal civil lawsuit against Officer Parker and the Madison police for multiple civil rights violations, assault, and excessive force. I've been collaborating with the Institute for Justice over the past few months on this story, as they've recently started a nonprofit organization, Americans Against Qualified Immunity, a grassroots initiative devoted to a simple idea. If we, the people, must follow the law, our government must follow the Constitution. This collab is fitting, as Officer Parker's criminal case was dropped, but in the civil case, he claimed qualified immunity and was denied for the excessive force complaint. Here's Patrick Giacomo to explain more of what that means. I'm Patrick Giacomo, an attorney at the Institute for Justice, working on our project on immunity and accountability. What's so interesting about the Patel case is that it illustrates the difference between criminal liability and civil liability when it comes to constitutional violations. The doctrine of qualified immunity is a general and default immunity for all government workers, including police, from civil liability, unless the person accusing them of wrongdoing can point to an earlier case involving substantially similar facts that would clearly establish the constitutional violation. But that immunity has no application in a criminal case. So the question becomes, how is it possible that Officer Parker was denied that qualified immunity in the civil case, but he was nevertheless acquitted in the criminal case? And the answer lies in two features of our system. First, to bring a constitutional criminal case against a police officer, the government has to show that the officer willfully violated someone's constitutional rights. There has to be evidence that they subjectively intended to violate the Constitution. And the government has to establish that beyond a reasonable doubt. Those features mean that even though qualified immunity itself is a very high hurdle for civil liability, the criminal standard is still much higher. And they also illustrate the importance of civil liability, because unlike criminal liability where a prosecutor has to move the case forward, civil liability allows the individual victim to move forward the case on their own, and at the end of the case, ensures that they have a potential remedy for their constitutional violation. In April of 2021, Patel settled the lawsuit for $1.75 million. Though Officer Parker was denied qualified immunity on the excessive force claim, his insurance carrier ultimately paid the settlement and the case was formally dismissed. The burden of Officer Parker's violent aggression and horrific misunderstanding of the laws was essentially swept under the rug. Officer Parker never had to pay for his crime against Mr. Patel and was rehired a year after the incident, though it appears that Officer Parker no longer works for Madison Police. A huge thanks to Patrick and the Institute for Justice for 